Our last speaker of the day is going to be talking to us about Alzheimer's disease and the impact on language. Dr. Amy Pierce has her medical degree from Columbia College of Physicians and Surgeons, a neurology residency at UCLA, a geriatric neurology and dementia fellowship at UC San Diego, and currently she is an assistant clinical professor in the Department of Neurology at UC Irvine. She's the medical director of the UC Mind Institute, and her focus is in diagnosis, treatment, and research of dementia. She's the lead investigator in three current clinical trials for Alzheimer's at UC Irvine, including the A4 anti-amyloid treatment in asymptomatic Alzheimer's disease study. Her passion for improving care and getting to cure is evident, and a little known fact is that she loves opera and her favorite work is Carmen. Please welcome Dr. Amy Pierce. Thank you very much. And um, first, I would just like to say um, that at the UC Irvine uh, ADRC, uh, we do follow uh, research participants longitudinally, and we do require brain donation of all of our uh, participants, except for very rare circumstances if there's a, a strong religious or cultural belief that would prevent a, a participant from doing so. So um, we are on board and, and find that to be extremely important. So, um, and today, uh, now I'd just like to speak about um, the link between Alzheimer's disease and language. And so, uh, it's very clear that Alzheimer's disease affects a person's language abilities. And we heard that from many of our uh, panel members earlier, that they noticed word-finding difficulty, trouble uh, speaking. Um, but it's also starting to become known that a person's language of abilities or language skills can affect their Alzheimer's disease and their risk of Alzheimer's disease. So uh, today I'll speak a little bit about the effects of bilingualism on the brain, um, then go over the language deficits in MCI and Alzheimer's disease dementia. Then I'll discuss the presentation of Alzheimer's disease dementia in bilinguals and how that may be different from monolinguals. I'll speak about the uh, bilingualism and the risk of Alzheimer's disease, and perhaps it may reduce or increase a person's risk. And uh, finally finish up talking about bilingualism as a factor in the concept of cognitive reserve. And so why is this important? Um, well, it's important because uh, bilingualism is actually uh, very uh, normal and very common. So um, just raise your hand if you are bilingual in the room. Very, very good. So um, in the United States, um, we know that uh, at, at the bottom of the graph, we can see that nearing 20% of individuals in the United States speak a language other than English in their home. So there's at least 20% of the United States is bilingual, probably quite a bit more. Um, but we are dwarfed by um, other countries around the world. Um, in the European Union as a whole, 56% um, of citizens are bilingual. Um, and just looking at uh, some countries in, in, for example, Germany, about two-thirds are, uh, but when you come to other countries in the European Union, Union, like Sweden, Luxembourg, we're in the very, very high 90s. And in fact, Lungs Luxembourg, with 99% of indi individuals speaking more than one language, is considered um, a language laboratory, and uh, speaking two up to seven languages can be common. So, um, in terms of the, the way that uh, bilingual, bilingualism is processed in the brain, or two languages are processed in the brain, um, we know that there is evidence of joint activation of both languages in the brain at all times, and this is based on neuropsychologic studies as well as MRI studies. And so um, even if a person is conversing in um, a particular language, um, both languages in the brain are being activated, and this creates an attentional problem for the speaker. Um, the bilingual speaker must select the correct language from competing options and inhibit the non-target language. And this is happening all the time for bilinguals. It's, uh, most of it is probably, some of it may be conscious, most of it is probably unconscious. Um, and this language switching is accompanied by activation of an important area of the brain called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And this is a brain area which is important for executive control. 
And executive control refers to a type of mental function that um, we consider uh, would be important for a good executive, like a CEO. So uh, a good one, though. So um, being able to <laughs> being able to make good decisions, um, make make good judgments, delay gratification, um, and uh, change course when appropriate. So that's that's what comprises executive control, and it's important for all of us. Um, but uh, the area of, it, of brain important for executive control is active uh, very often and all the time and much more in bilinguals than in uh, monolinguals. And uh, this is uh, to show that area of the brain. Um, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is the main area, but also supplemental motor area and superior parietal lobular are important as well. So how about the effects of bilingualism on cognitive testing? So. Um, when bilinguals are, are tested on um, neuropsychologic testing like we do in a research setting or, or in an office setting, um, on picture naming tasks, bilinguals are slower and less accurate than my monolinguals even when tested in their first and dominant language. And this probably has to do with um, controlling that attention. Um, and this is slower to a small degree. Um, they're also a bit slower in a uh, task of semantic fluency. And this is a task where um, people are instructed, tell me as many animals as you can name in a minute, or tell me as many vegetables you can name in a minute. And so they uh, don't name quite as many, uh, and many animals or vegetables as a uh, monolingual. Um, but what's very interesting is in other tests that are non-language tests, um, bilinguals uh, showed better performance than monolinguals. Um, they showed better performance on executive control ta tasks, and so these are, again, tasks of divided attention, changing course when appropriate. And they also uh, showed better performance in episodic memory recall tests, so uh, memory for uh, stories or dis discrete events, not procedural memory, which would be memory for motor control or riding a bike. That was the same. And so thus, there is evidence for both cognitive advantage and disadvantages in bilingual adults. And this is for um, normal adults throughout the lifespan. And so um, just, as I, just to summarize, the areas where there's a bit of disadvantage for bilinguals, uh, vocabulary, picture naming, and semantic fluency, and the areas of advantage are executive control and episodic memory. And how about the effects of bilingualism on brain connectivity? And um, what we know is that with normal brain aging, um, there can be reduced myelin, um, small vessel alterations, and reduced axonal structure and coherence as measured on DTI imaging. And so d um, the, uh, of course, the, the areas of the brain um, are connected by uh, myelinated axons. So the, this is the white matter of the brain. And um, this can be uh, looked at and measured with a particular type of MRI imaging called DTI imaging, diffusion tensor imaging. And that allows us to see how well these connections are holding up um, over time. And so in a study of 28 healthy older adults, 14 bilinguals and 14 monolinguals, um, all had normal cognitive testing and they were matched for age and education levels. And what was noted in these healthy um, older adults that on their MRI brain DTI imaging, the bilingual showed better maintenance of the white matter connectivity um, in the corpus callosum, um, superior longitudinal fasciculus, the IFOF, and the uncinate fasciculus. So these areas of connection um, in bilingual brains held up better over time um, than in the monolinguals. And uh, these are some of the areas um, that, uh, that showed increased white matter co um, connectivity that are shown in the uh, areas orange, so coming across the corpus callosum and coming up across the uncinate fasciculus, from, which is important uh, connecting areas of memory up to the frontal lobes. Okay. So that's what we know about um, bilingualism um, and the effects on the brain in, uh, in terms of cognitive testing and connections in healthy older adults. Um, now I'm going to switch gears just for a minute to talk about the language deficits that arise in Alzheimer's disease in all patients with Alzheimer's disease, whether they're mono or bilingual. And so um, as, as we've heard today and, and perhaps um, know from our own life, um, Alzheimer's disease is characterized in many cases, in most cases, by short-term memory impairment, um, in particular rapid forgetting of new information. Um, but language deficits are common in, in Alzheimer's disease and often manifest as word retrieval uh, difficulties, so difficulty finding words. 
And these language deficits are uh, tested mainly by asking, again, the patient to name items or uh, that uh, they're shown pictures of or um, trying to name as many words as they can in a minute, either um, of a semantic category like animals or vegetables or cars or of a phonemic category, so words that start with the letter F, A, or S. And interestingly, in Alzheimer's disease, uh, patients typically have worse semantic fluency than phonemic fluency, harder for them to name as many animals as they can than words that start with a particular letter. And um, it, these language deficits in Alzheimer's disease uh, may be, are, are thought to be due to impaired semantic memory. And so semantics refers to word meaning. And so um, in Alzheimer's disease, as it progresses, there can be the loss of knowledge of particular uh, words and their word meaning and the associations among them. And that may be why their semantic fluency is worse than their phonemic. And so uh, what's known is that in the initial stages of Alzheimer's disease, the what's called the lexicosemantic system disintegrates progressively. Um, and so, again, this just means the word system and the word meaning system disintegrates, whereas early in the course of Alzheimer's, the phonological and syntactic systems remain relatively preserved. So that means the articulation um, and the grammar structure remains preserved in the early stages of Alzheimer's disease. Um, but as Alzheimer's progresses, all levels of linguistic structure um, deteriorate, so not just uh, uh, words and word meaning, but uh, also uh, articulation and grammar um, disintegrate um, until in the very, very advanced stages of Alzheimer's, mutism results. Um, there is uh, the, uh, an, a related disorder, which is um, generally classified as part of frontotemporal dementia, um, which uh, we heard about a little bit, um, which is called logopenic primary progressive aphasia. And in this condition, a patient starts out with hesitant, grammatically correct speech with word finding pauses, with preserved language comprehension, tends to be slowly progressive, affects language very early and later, later on can affect memory. And in this disease um, is often due to Alzheimer's disease pathology, the plaques and tangles, but um, it's considered a variant presentation or um, uh, a non-memory presentation of Alzheimer's disease in many cases. So that was, um, that's how Alzheimer's affects language in, in, in mono and bilinguals, but how, how may Alzheimer's present in bilinguals that might be slightly different? And so what is often um, noted in caregiver reports is that uh, a patient with Alzheimer's disease who's a bilingual may um, start to uh, do some language mixing, so um, switching from one language to the other, um, switching to uh, or, or just only speaking in a language in an inappropriate setting. Um, and also, perhaps, uh, there's often reports that there may be a regression um, to use L1. And so in linguistics, L1 is referred to the first and dominant language, L2 to the second language learned. You can go all the way up to L7 if you're in Luxembourg, I guess. But um, it's, uh, this, is, this is something that's commonly noticed by caregivers and reported um, to physicians. But um, does, it, does it really hold up when it's, when it's tested? So uh, the question is, does AD differentially, Alzheimer's disease differentially affect L1 or L2, the first language or the second language? And so this uh, was studied in um, Barcelona in Catalan Spanish bilinguals um, with Alzheimer's disease. And um, in these patients, um, they had these, uh, uh, in both languages, they had very similar deficits on the similar tests. They had typical fluent speech, but they had the word finding difficulties. They had impaired comprehension of complex grammatical, grammatical structures only, and they had preserved automatic language, repetition and reading aloud. And um, what, what the researchers noted is that, is that both languages declined to a similar extent as dementia progressed, both the first language and the second language. And this is to show that uh, the mini mental score um, is on the x-axis. So higher mini mental um, score is, is better, and as the disease progresses, the mini mental gets slower. And then this is a uh, performance on language tests. And the dominant language um, is uh, a black line, and the non-dominant is in the lighter line. And both um, languages are declining at this similar slope, although performance was um, better a little bit uh, the whole way through in the dominant language. How about the hypothesis that um, persons with um, dementia regress to um, pr use primarily their first language? <coughs> 
And uh, this was a study of Spanish Eng English bilinguals with Alzheimer's disease conducted down in um, San Diego by um, Dr. Gollin. And um, what was noticed uh, here, these were, um, ag again, Spanish English bilinguals, and they were tested on the, using the Boston naming, picture naming test. And what was noticed, the performance um, uh, compa was compared in normal controls and uh, persons with Alzheimer's disease. And so you can see that um, performance in their dominant language was in the darker gray bar, and performance in the non-dominant language was in the lighter gray bar, third over. And so um, there was decline, you know, comparing normal controls versus Alzheimer's disease among um, all of the languages. But actually, the biggest decline in terms of this test was noted in the dominant language, actually, not the non-dominant. And um, this was a, a surprise to um, researchers. And uh, they suggested that this greater vulnerability of the dominant language may be due to the fact that in the dominant language there are richer um, semantic networks or meaning networks connecting uh, the words, and these networks um, tend to be uh, affected in Alzheimer's disease. So the, for that reason, the dominant language was a bit more vulnerable. And in, in this, this study, again, this was um, Spanish-English bi bilinguals. Them all had, um, there were 11 mild AD patients and they were um, matched to healthy elderly controls. And again, um, on the semantic fluency versus the phonemic fluency, remembering semantic is naming as many animals as one can in a minute, phonemic is naming as many words that start with the letter F in a minute. There was a clearly decline from the uh, comparing controls and Alzheimer's patients on both um, phonemic and uh, semantic categories, um, but the, and the decline was more severe in semantic categories, and it was similar across both languages. And in these cases, Spanish was the primary language. So there doesn't seem to be clear evidence that um, uh, L1, the first language, is preserved in bilinguals, um, and uh, it appears that Alzheimer's disease affects both languages um, similarly, or perhaps even on some tasks, L1 worse. How about the effects of bilingualism on brain atrophy in patients with Alzheimer's disease? So um, we have, have heard earlier about um, it's, it's very clear that there's quite a bit of atrophy uh, of the brain in Alzheimer's disease. And um, this is a study which specifically looked at brain atrophy patterns in bilinguals versus monolinguals um, in Alzheimer's disease, a study of 20 in each group, um, and they all had mild Alzheimer's disease. And um, this study uh, used CAT scan rather than MRI, um, but what was interesting to note is that the bilinguals actually showed greater or worse atrophy than the monolinguals and particularly um, on the temporal lobe, so where the hippocampus is, an area is important for memory. And so this is just to show where the measurements were made. Um, hippocampus is on the mesial temporal lobe, and they measured the uh, size of the la uh, lateral ventricle as well as the third ventricle. And they identified, again, in patients who were matched for level or stage of dementia, bilinguals had more atrophy than the monolinguals. So what's, what's going on there? Um, the hypothesis is that um, the bilinguals have some amount of cognitive reserve, and so they require a greater amount of atrophy or um, pathology in the brain um, to express a dementia to a certain level. And so they perhaps had their uh, Alzheimer's pathology going on longer, or it's more severe now, um, in order to be equivalent to the monolinguals. So actually, this is, uh, ev this is, um, circumstantial evidence that bilingualism may be protective. Um, how about the question of whether bilingualism affects a person's risk of developing Alzheimer's disease? And so several studies um, have tried to answer this question, um, and they have uh, very differing populations, which can make direct comparison a bit difficult. Um, and all of this, many of the studies also encounter the problem that bilinguals and monolinguals may differ in numerous ways, apart from just the number of languages spoken. Um, so, uh, for example, in the United States, um, uh, a large proportion of the bilinguals may be immigrants to the United States, um, and um, they may have differing access levels to education, socioeconomic status, access to medical care, or cultural attitudes regarding dementia, which may change a person's um, timing when they present for medical care. 
And there's se several things to consider. Bilingualism um, may impact the risk of uh, developing Alzheimer's disease dementia. It may impact a person's age of onset or the rate of progression. And so all of these are different questions and the studies um, don't all look at the same question. Um, but one of the uh, first and uh, uh, most important studies on this was um, done in Toronto and uh, 2007. And uh, this was of 184 patients who were referred to a memory clinic in Toronto. And um, of the 184, 93, or 51%, were bilingual. And of this group, there were 25 different languages represented, um, the most common being Polish, Yiddish, or German. Um, and in this group of patients coming into a memory clinic, the age of onset of um, dementia was four years later in the bilinguals. So the age of onset in the uh, bilinguals was 75, and the monolinguals was 71. Um, what was noted was that the severity at the initial visit based on the mini mental state exam was similar between the two groups, and also as they were followed over time, the rate of decline was similar. Um, and so the author suggested this was uh, an example of uh, bilingualism um, delaying the onset of Alzheimer's dementia. Um, they also pointed out that um, neither education nor occupational status differences could account for these findings. Um, it is, it is known that there are some factors of cognitive reserve like um, education, prolonged mental activity during occupation can reduce a person's risk of Alzheimer's dementia. Um, but actually the bilinguals in the group had a um, bit uh, fewer years of education and they were very similar on occupational status. So this, um, uh, they took this as being um, a language effect rather than um, an education effect. But there were um, some significant caveats to the Toronto study, and the first being that there was a very significant difference in the uh, percent of immigrants in, in the groups. So the monolinguals in the group were 85% Canadian born, um, while the bilinguals were 90% immigrants to can Canada. So um, they were almost switched in terms of percentages. And of, uh, as you may have guessed from the languages and the timing when the study was done, the majority of the bilinguals were immigrants from Europe in the 1940s. Um, so uh, escaping from um, uh, war in, in Nazi Germany. And so there were very different cultural backgrounds in the groups and also different stressors that um, they were exposed to early in life. And you might think, well, that, that should favor the monolinguals. They were happy in Canada um, all along. But um, these, these sorts of life stressors and exposure to caloric um, deprivation, perhaps, um, may have unexpected or unanticipated effects on, on brain health later in life. So um, you can't always uh, know which way a direction of protection might go. So a, a similar study was um, uh, done trying to um, test or replicate the Toronto findings, and that was done in Montreal. Um, and uh, this was of 632 persons diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease in Montreal. And in, in this group, among non-immigrants, so um, clearly uh, Montreal is a special, um, well, it, it's a special area. So um, Fran uh, French and English are both um, um, uh, official languages there, and so there are quite a number of bilinguals who are non-immigrants. And so um, among these non-immigrants, there was no difference in the age of diagnosis between bilinguals and monolinguals. Um, however, um, when they only looked at th their participants who were immigrants, again, there was that significant delay in diagnosis or, uh, um, by the increasing number of languages. So monolinguals were diagnosed five years earlier than bilinguals, or 6.4 years earlier than um, trilinguals. And so the uh, um, interpretation there was multilingualism, but not always bilingualism delays onset of Alzheimer's disease, maybe more so in immigrants. And I think another just important study to look at um, was one conducted up in um, Washington Heights in New York City. Um, and here, um, they, they enrolled a hun over 1,000 non-demented residents of Washington Heights. All of them were immigrants to the United States. They were all native Spanish speakers who had varying degrees of bilingualism. And they were followed for 20, up to 23 years for the development of dementia. So this is, this is quite different. This, these aren't people coming into a memory clinic. These are people who are being followed um, in their natural environment and uh, tested for the um, uh, incidence of dementia. 
And what the researchers found was that um, greater levels of bilingualism at the start was associated with better initial performance on executive function and memory. So this goes back to um, the very beginning of the talk where I, uh, I, point, I mentioned that there is data that bilinguals do have this um, advantage on their scores on executive function and memory. Um, but over time, bilingualism was not associated with the rate of change on cognitive tests. So um, the, uh, the group as a whole did have s decline on some of their cognitive tests just with aging. Um, and they found that bilingualism was not associated with the risk of developing dementia. Um, and uh, this, this group has some advantages um, compared to the Canada groups because um, it was a prospective study and um, the a group was a bit more homogeneous. Um, they mainly comprised immigrants from the Caribbean, um, coming from Dominican Republic, um, Puerto Rico, or Cuba, um, rather than um, from a variety of other countries speaking a variety of languages. It was all that one um, Spanish-English bilinguals. So we are left with conflicting studies on the effect of bilingualism on the risk of dementia. So um, studies um, on the left, um, are those that uh, suggest bilingualism is protective in terms of a person's risk of developing dementia. Studies on the right suggest that bilingualism is not protective, and the ones that are starred are the ones that um, I already described. Um, and what's quite, uh, what, what actually turns up, and I would just, I'll also just mention the Luxembourg study. Um, this study that suggested that there was protection um, was looking uh, at for the uh, development of CIND, which is kind of equivalent to MCI, mild cognitive impairment. CIND stands for cognitive impairment not demented. And in Luxembourg, they can't compare bilinguals to monolinguals. They have to compare multilinguals to bilinguals because they don't have any really monolinguals to look at. So here they're looking for a dose effect. And actually, in, in the Luxembourg group, the multilinguals had a reduced risk of this um, cognitive impairment than compared to bilinguals. But um, I think it's important to note that studies on the right that showed that bilingualism was not protected do have some advantages over the studies on the left. And the majority of the studies on, on the right, which showed that there was no benefit, um, tended to be prospective, so um, avoiding that referral bias or presentation bias to memory clinics. And um, uh, the studies um, tended to be larger um, and in some ways, the studies uh, had more homogeneous participants, so looking at just a particular language or in a particular group rather than kind of all comers. Um, and so um, overall, the evidence is, is really rather mixed as to whether or not bilingualism could protect a, a given person um, or reduce their risk of developing AD. So what about cognitive reserve? If bilingualism is protective um, in any way, um, it may be acting through this concept of cognitive reserve. And so cognitive reserve refers to the idea that some factors allow a person to function within a normal cognitive range, despite the presence of brain pathology that would usually be accompanied by dementia. And so there are um, several uh, lifestyle uh, factors um, that are known to be associated with lower rates of dementia. And so high levels of education, or high occupational status, or mentally taxing occupation, um, intelligence levels, performance of mentally stimulating leisure activities in middle age and older age, um, physical exercise, and then we come to perhaps bilingualism. And how, how, does this, how does this work? How do these activities perhaps protect a person um, from expressing dementia even though they have pathology in their brain? And so um, there's the concept of brain reserve and cognitive reserve. So brain reserve, um, this arises from physical properties of the brain. So perhaps if a person has uh, increased brain size or neuron count or synapse count, which are the connections between the neurons, or levels of connectivity, um, they may be protected from pathology. Um, and so uh, this is sort of a threshold model. So once uh, brain reserve is depleted past some fixed critical threshold, specific deficits emerge. So uh, the brain can handle um, a heavier load or burden of pathology, whatever type of pathology it is, because it has some uh, physical advantages. And cognitive reserve refers to the idea that activities or experiences during life can build brain reserve in some way. 
and what could that connection be? So how, how could cognitive reserve protect against dementia? Perhaps by enhancing neuronal plasticity, so um, strengthening the connections between areas of the brain or allowing compensatory use of alternative brain regions. So if one brain region is um, injured or harmed, another can, can take over. Or by enriching the brain vasculature. We've heard a lot about um, uh, brain vasculature, and there are some um, um, intriguing ways where um, blood delivery and blood flow to the brain can be um, enhanced by different brain activities. And so how important is cognitive reserve? It's, it's uh, actually very important. Um, because we, we do know that there are many people who have heavy pathology um, on their brain autopsies, but they do not have uh, dementia. Maybe they have MCI, maybe they're pre-symptomatic, but they are not expressing dementia, and so they're in some ways resistant. And in some studies, it's uh, up to 30%. And so um, these people may have higher cognitive reserve than those who are expressing symptoms. And so um, the idea is that cognitive reserve mediates the link between pathology and memory performance. So for example, if this is burden of pathology over time, and this is cognitive test performance, a person with high cognitive reserve may be scoring better with someone with low cognitive reserve. They both ac accumulate pathology over time. A uh, person with low reserve would start to express symptoms earlier than that, that person with high reserve. Ultimately, both of them will um, progress to maximal pathology, and so the uh, individual with high cognitive reserve would be diagnosed later because they don't express symptoms later, but they may actually progress faster. And there are some, um, some findings bearing this out that cognitive reserve may protect a person um, against uh, diagnosis, but once they are diagnosed, they may progress fast, faster, and this is in particularly in regards to education level. So high education level may uh, protect against overall rate uh, risk of diagnosis, but they may have higher rates of cognitive decline or speed of cognitive decline. And um, this also um, is shown, for example, here, um, there's an inverse relationship between education level and cerebral blood flow. So this is a SPECT scan. We haven't heard much about SPECT scans, but um, it, it uh, demonstrates cerebral blood flow. And on SPECT scan, persons also have that same classic parietotemporal hypometabolism as um, on PET scans. Um, and in this study, which was actually very important for understanding cognitive reserve, there were 20 patients in each group. They all had Alzheimer's disease. And they were matched for clinical severity. And uh, these were the patients with high levels of education, medium levels of education, and low. And actually, again, the group with high levels of education showed worse cerebral blood flow and um, thought to have heavier burdens of Alzheimer's disease pathology, but their high levels of education and cognitive reserve were protecting them so that they were um, not as advanced as they otherwise would be. They, would, they were performing similarly to those who had lower education. And how about the magnitude of, of cognitive reserve effects? So um, it's, it's actually very important. And um, in this meta-analysis of over 29 studies um, that involved over 29,000 persons, um, it was found that higher levels of education, mentally stimulating occupation, higher premorbid IQ, and mentally stimulating leisure activity um, reduced the risk of dementia in the groups as a whole by, in some studies, uh, up to 42 to 50 percent. So um, we, we heard a lot about um, uh, doing all of the uh, things in terms of diet and exercise, avoiding of smoking to reduce our vascular risk factors. Um, but there's, there is a, a strong link between cognitive reserve and dementia as well, and so we need to um, uh, think about that and address that as well. Um, there are some limitations in the concept of cognitive reserve, and the first is that it's correlational in nature. And so the question arises is, um, do individuals who have high education uh, abilities, high occupational attainment, do they just have more genetically well-endowed brains. Maybe they happen to have more neurons, they were born with no more synapses, better connections, and that you know, allowed them to succeed in life, um, uh, go on and do all these things, and then resist Alzheimer's disease. And it wasn't really the activities that led to the protection against Alzheimer's disease. Um, or the, the flip side is, does this education and occupational attainment lead to the cognitive reserve and the protection against dementia? And so for this reason, bilingualism is kind of interesting to think about and, and um, test because bilingualism is, is generally not due to an inherited brain characteristic. It's not due to a person having um, an excellent language lobe of the brain. Um, it's 
in many cases due to um, immigration um, or a difference between the family language and the language of school or workplace. And so um, thus bilingualism is often an, an environmental factor that could theoretically produce cognitive reserve. This may hold for bilinguals. Um, once you start getting into the super multilinguals, then they probably do have um, you know, some reason that they like learning languages and perhaps some um, biological uh, advantages. Um, but uh, for bilinguals, um, anyone um, can and does become bilingual um, given the right environmental circumstances. Um, so is there evidence that bilingualism is a form of cognitive reserve? Um, so in some ways there is, and, and that comes back to the fact that um, bilinguals are, uh, have um, enhanced utilization of their executive function system and cognitive control going all the time, allowing them to select the appropriate language and switch appropriately. And this um, continued use of executive control in language domains spreads to better executive control in other types of decision making. And um, in, in this study, again, um, done down in San Diego, um, there was a 44 Spanish Eng English bilinguals who were diagnosed uh, with Alzheimer's disease. They all had varying degrees of bilingualism based on the Boston naming test, but Spanish was their first language. And in this case, increasing degree of bilingualism was associated with later age of diagnosis. Um, and so here, age of diagnosis versus increasing levels of bilingualism. Um, oops, or, or the other way around, but only in those with 11 years of education or less. And so in the high education bilinguals, there was no um, uh, effective amount of bi bilingualism in age of diagnosis. And so it raised the question, is there an upper limit on the amount of cognitive reserve that it can accumulate um, from being a bilingual? Perhaps. And so there are further questions. Um, is, uh, would, if, if bilingualism helps to, uh, to a degree, would multilingualism help more? How about the level of a person's bilingualism? Is it better to be a balanced bilingual, or is it better, or even if there's a small amount of language proficiency um, in a second language, would that, would that help? How about the age of becoming bilingual? Is it better if it happens at a very young age, or um, could, there, could there be benefits of it if it occurred in um, middle age or later? How about the similarity between language? Is there more of a benefit if the two languages are very similar and thus perhaps harder to um, distinguish when um, the brain is doing that? Or is it better if they're very different and you're having to learn two completely different systems of grammar and, and writing? And then finally, is bilingualism additive with other forms of cognitive reserve? Or is there a maximum cognitive reserve which cannot be exceeded and bilingualism is only part of that? And so in conclusion, um, there is good data that bilinguals show better memory and executive function than monolinguals uh, throughout the lifespan. Um, when bilinguals develop Alzheimer's disease, both languages decline, not just the second language, and they decline to a similar degree. And there's um, uh, the po potential or possibility that bilingualism, or especially multilingualism, um, may delay the risk of Alzheimer's disease. But it's not fully known. Um, but in the meantime, we can all um, parler français, and uh, merci. Thank you.